So, um, uh, anyway, uh, because of the astrologics uh, that's been happening right now, we've been uh, in, we have been in the Scorpio frame work, the astro astrology of Scorpio. Scorpio um, is unique because it's in between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Sagittarius has his bow, he's pointing his arrow, and it points right to the tail tip of, uh, of Scorpio. Um, and uh, in the center of that is directly towards galactic center. So Scorpio kind of represents mm. basement. Wow. <laughs> all your deep, dark basement issues. And especially at this time, uh, 2012, i.e., we don't know the difference in the uh, true calendar, so I hear things that now, 2017, is the actual 2012, or what has been portended to be the 2012 moment. So at this, point, um, we are kind of facing directly towards galactic center, opening up, you know, the astrologics, let's open up the whole basement and have it all come up at once. <laughs> and so all the material that we've been going over with seeing your stories, how they create belief systems, and how those belief systems create the foundation for the inner tyrant and how the inner tyrant works on you. So working with all of that then, you can go back into the basement and you can start to de disentangle from those stories, from the belief systems, and disengage the inner tyrant. Now the inner child is really important to disengage from the inner tyrant or to flag when the inner tyrant's kicking you to go do something that's a program. It's an unconscious program. So anyway, um, while we're at this juncture with the galactic center, galactic's like looking straight down into your basement. How are you doing with your stories? So all the work we've been doing, this is phenomenal that we've been attracted to work on this material, especially at this time. Now, <clears throat> also you have Saturn and you have Jupiter that have concurrently come into alignment with this juncture right now, and so Saturn and Jupiter, they're like magnifying glasses on your issues, and we've been kind of retrograde and, and prograde, <laughs> so we've been kind of visiting the basement, take a little break, go back to the basement, go back to the issues with a bigger magnifying glass. <laughs> Do you really get it now? Do you really see? So it's been really important to disentangle from polarized belief systems, right? So radical self-love is about not judging yourself for the roots of unconsciousness, but if you look at them with that kind of compassion and appreciation, then they can build the bridge the bridge starts so showing up for the dualities to come together. And those, all those dualities start coming into the heart. So there, it's like, if you're not going to judge your basement, well, then it can come home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Mars, and, I mean, excuse me, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, they're like the lords of karma and the great father, right? Are you doing your work? What are you, what's stopping you from doing your work for self-liberation um, is really what it's about. And self-empowerment, okay? So you have these two, but they're starting to move out of the way and Ju uh, Mars is starting to come in and what's Mars? <laughs> War. <laughs> so if you haven't done your work, man, the, the propensity for, um, um, Rage, outrage, indignation, and intolerance is going to come magnified. Because you need that compassion and appreciation for yourself. So 
when rage hits, it just helps you focus. It's the focus you need in order to see what is keeping you separate from yourself. Where did you separate? Right? How did you turn? How are you with turning the horseshoe magnets from repel, repulsion, and start to appreciate and bring them back into attraction so that your dualities can come home? Okay? So, if that's what's occurring, if that's starting to work inside of you, and you're putting these things together and you're starting to apply them to yourself in your basement, well, the galactic's there and Jupiter and Saturn are looking over your shoulder, <laughs> going, good work, keep going. Uh, <laughs> then, right in the astrologic, you have Ophiuchus, who stands right above where Sagittarius points his arrow and the tail tip of Scorpio. Ophiuchus stands with a serpent over his head, as in victory. Hmm. So, if you're able to take the serpent of unconsciousness, which is your life force energy as it traversed through the bottom realm, the realm of the void, the realm of unconsciousness, and now you've appreciated its journey, you're no longer fighting your unconscious side, you're starting to appreciate it, then you start to come home. That's victory. Ophiuchus stands over the gateway to the galactic because you can come home if you're not judging yourself. That's really the message. So it's really unique at this moment in time that we have. And this is supposed to, we're going to keep doing basement excursions <laughs> until about uh, the middle of uh, January. So we have plenty of time to revisit old stories for the reintegration of that, of any of those stories, any of those issues. From the standpoint, as we've been working on this, the standpoint of not uh, denying, not running away, but you being the steward, the, the mother slash father, the parent of all of your incomplete children, all your incomplete dualities, childlike issues that are ready to come forward. So it's a huge opportunity, a huge moment in time for all of us right now. So many of you got to see the video, struggled through the video from last session. Um, what night was that? That was November 9th, I believe it was, November 10th. Uh, 2017, November. So tonight's uh, December 14th, 2017, and tonight, um, Tonight's title is Apex Moment, Unconscious Contracts and Dreams. <laughs> so where we left off um, in the last uh, evening session, um, I laid down a lot of groundwork um, for understanding the Waterloo Moment. Everybody remember the Waterloo moment, okay? So I'm going to refresh uh, the Waterloo moment. Um, and our Waterloo moment was, in effect, where everything branched out for us, where everything negative happened for us. The most traumatic event in our life happened um, for us. And um, when... Uh, I was talking about the um, traumatic moment, <clears throat> the Waterloo moment. Um, Waterloo for Napoleon was a really bad day. Uh, 1815, Belgium, and I think there was seven different uh, um, countries that allied and went against Napoleon. And I think it was the Prussians that saved the day for uh, the British and the um, Russians. 
or the Allies. <clears throat> so everyone was expecting uh, Napoleon to win. Um, even he was. <laughs> and everything came crashing down for him. So I'm using that as an analogy um, for a period in time where <clears throat> your whole paradigm was crushed, shattered. And in that shattering, I talked about uh, the windshield, like we've all noticed on a on our windshield whenever a rock hits, and it happens far too often. But you'll have wave-like, you'll have wave-like uh, patterns, but you'll also have linear, angular fractures, splits, and so on. And I talked about how the wave-like patterns are kind of like emotions, and the linear ones kind of like thoughts, beliefs, stories. At any rate, um, my Waterloo moment, as I explained, was very traumatic for me at five years old, and it crushed my entire paradigm. And then Jim and I took a break and we started throwing chairs around it. <laughs> Had a little fun releasing that energy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so at that apex, oh, excuse me, at that Waterloo moment, I could see, uh, as I tracked it back, that all those seven major roots of the unconsciousness were there. Yes, we had the more surface emotions as I've drawn in this illustration here. So there was a level of guilt, pain, anger, grief, blame, shame, and fear. Those are kind of surface, and they have their little fractures, almost like the windshield. So when you go to try to repair the original wound, um, you can hit many junctures trying to track back where the original core trauma or fear or issue was, and you may uh, traverse many layers of surface emotions, but you know you're getting somewhere when the rage band comes up, identified in red here. Rage, outrage, indignation, and intolerance. This requires great, great focus in order to uncover the um, seven roots of unconsciousness. And as I went over those, guiltiness, powerlessness, worthlessness, neediness, helplessness, hopelessness, those have to be discovered and dealt with and understood, seen clearly, so that you can abide in nothingness. Why? Because the ego hates nothingness. <laughs> to be nothing to the ego is one of the most humiliating of emotions that we have. Um, so if you deal with the, these roots here, <clears throat> then you can abide in nothingness, and inside of the nothingness, that helps you depolarize, unjudge, or not judge, from moving into uh, the center of the heart. And God, I'm getting all of these downloads that are, go this way, no, go this way, go this way. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Be linear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um. <laughs> now, you've seen this in the last graphic, that the, spi the speeding up of time the spiraling of time from being under the galaxy for the last 13,000 years. And as we've been um, speeding up, it's been increasing and to creating like a centrifuge. And that centrifuge has us drawing episodes where we move towards the singularity. And that singularity is like the fugue, like being in the void, being in a crucible, 
and you're dealing with all of your own emotions, all of your unfinished stories, your incomplete stories. And so the entanglement, uh, excuse me, this, uh, the singularity, its job is to show you what's needing to be untangled. And remember, we're just consciousness, so we just need to see it and accept it. When we fight it and deny it and run from it or try to improve ourselves from it, then we start moving away from it. <clears throat> so, um, I went over in that last one when talking about the Waterloo moment, the six directions. Everybody remember this part, okay? And the six directions help us understand the movement where we're changing. Right here, we change from external focus to internal focus. We start looking at getting our answers inside. And that opens up the quantum doorway. And it also helps with the bridges of the dualities. All right. Okay, the bridges of the dualities help me to see <coughs> that <coughs> my inner child, which had the Waterloo experience, was looking for something. And that something, as I shared with you in the, in, in the last video uh, and the last class, um, Knowing that the dualities are looking for each other, my inner child in unconsciousness created a timeline, an entanglement timeline, which had actors. And those actors help condition me. <laughs> through an avenue that would definitely get my attention, which was pain. And in the um, pain and suffering that I went through, now I can look back and see that what I was looking for was me. I was split from myself. <clears throat> So, in the experience of my Waterloo, and I went over all that material about the sun and how the sun in the five elements and the four, um, uh, four states of matter, it's very difficult for it to manage it. So, there's holes in there. And those holes are very much like the wreath of um, thorns and the crown of thorns. And so this symbol, the crown of thorns, is like the stories that pain you. And the wreath of thorns are the situations that emotionally pain you. So for me, um, when I was back in my Waterloo moment, knowing that the dualities are seeking each other. My inner child is seeking something. If I look at my, my dad, look at my mom, and look at my brother, I'm wanting something from each of them. I'm wanting, and we can look back at that uh, diagram, but I'm wanting all seven of those roots of unconsciousness. Each of those seven roots, I'm wanting First of all, not to be abandoned and betrayed, which created my guiltiness and unworthiness. How can you ever fill the hole of abandonment, betrayal, slash 
guiltiness, unworthiness. You're never going to do it by consuming actions. So penance, anything that you could think of is not going to fill that hole until you see clearly that what you're looking for is how did you separate from you? Well, remember, we started here looking externally in all directions for our fulfillment. So back at our Waterloo moment, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to go. So the only place... Now, I've done a lot of different types of um, inner child processing. They're all helpful and they lead you to different stages. But until you can see that what you're looking for is you, and you the adult, you the steward of your inner tribe of the many cherubs you have of incomplete processing, which are like little children on these different emotional aspects that we each of us has. So, at my Waterloo moment, I'm looking, as a child, I'm looking for my dad to comfort me. I'm looking for my mom to be there. So I'm looking for the archetypes, the masculine and feminine in the adult framework to be there to provide what I need. As a child growing up, the stability, the love, the guardianship, the protection, all of these things. But what's happening? It's fractured. It's completely destroyed. And there's a good reason for that. So now, when I go back with the understanding, it takes a lot of experience. We've been doing this a long time, in all actuality, to come to the point where we can find it in ourselves. We're so big, we're universal beings, right? Where do you look? <laughs> <laughs> we went looking in all six directions, all across the galaxy, all across the universe, in all these different <laughs> ET bodies and all this. In all these different timelines, and they're all happening right now on probability lines. They're all happening right now. So what's missing? Awakening. Awakening. So for me now, having the experience of going through all of that time and experience um, uh, in all these different probability lines, unconsciousness we can see, as we went over in the uh, workshop, superposition. Superposition is you being everywhere, on every probability line. And when you're in entanglement, then you manifest a timeline to work out the entanglements, <laughs> so you can see them. <laughs> so, when you collapse a timeline, you disassemble a timeline, it's because you awakened. So it's made out of consciousness stuff, right? The fabric of consciousness. So if you disassemble your timeline, you're no longer captured there. It was a moment in consciousness where you went through a very awful time to wake you up to see your split. To find you're looking for you. You're looking for you. Well, of course, as a child, you can't find yourself. But now as an adult, that child still lives. That probability is still there until you disassemble it. Hmm. We're still enacting actions and behaviors from that pain from that timeline, from that Waterloo, where all the fractures happen. Because the fracture that happened at Waterloo has fractals in all your probability lines, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> when I stood at my probability uh, um, Waterloo, my entanglement Waterloo, I realized I'm looking for my adult. Oh, I'm looking for me now to heal myself in that timeline. So what resulted was all of a sudden I felt like I was on a cross. I couldn't move. And coming through the holes 
like where the wreath of thorns was around the heart, were all the pains of everything I suffered in that room being beaten, being traumatized, being talked. You know, there were so many dramas that were happening in that. And as I accepted all the emotions back, like a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> I was pulling them all back. I was accepting them all back. So my timeline started collapsing. The roof started turning into sky and then nothing. And as it did, then I looked at my father. My father started collapsing because I discovered all seven of the roots of unconsciousness. So I knew this is my fracture. This is my fracture engaged right here. So as I pulled that back and allowed all those emotions, and it's painful, it hurts. The little kid felt all those things and all those feelings are valid. Those are valid feelings. You can't run from them. You gotta let them back into yourself. Yep, you're valid. That's exactly what I would have felt if I was there at your age experiencing just exactly how you were seeing the world at that time. And as you accept them, then there's no longer a fight, so the probability lines come in. They merge into the seventh direction, the quantum. So you move back into superposition. Your timeline starts dissolving. My dad dissolved before me and all there was was love and I realized that's me. <laughs> my mom, the same thing, and my brother. I have new respect for my brother. So anyway, that's what happened on that, um, on that occasion. And that has been what we've been talking about, not running from any of the roots of unconsciousness because running from it continues the um, wheel of karma until you wake up and you allow it back in and accept with non-duality and non-polarity, non-judgment, you see how it awakened you. So for me, that was a great liberation to now see just absolute love. Yeah, the conditions were like roots on a tree. It's dark and dirty and probably cold. But it led to the integration. Superposition happened when I allowed myself to retrieve, allow back home the split of myself in that timeline. So I went back a number of times to make sure I vacuum cleaned everything. <laughs> Got every emotion. <laughs> yep, I accept that. Come back. <laughs> and the, it's such a liberation there, but it also it helps you when you start looking down all these other timelines or you come across um, any of these little fractures. You know now absolutely when you go into superposition and you feel you're everything, that's undeniable. You've escaped the prison of the timeline of entanglement. And that makes you whole. So, uh, to my dad or my mom or my brother? No. All I did was try to see it clearly and keep the heart and mind open so much to allow it to disassemble and show me what it really is. It's our pain that makes it counterintuitive and makes us want to run from what we're feeling. But if we open ourselves, then <clears throat> something unusual happens. Yes, it hurts, but it leads to emancipation and disassembly of the 
timeline and the entanglement. And that's what we're here at this time to do is begin to understand how important disassembly, our crib, our crib consciousness, which is where all our Waterloo moments are. <clears throat> And in that, <clears throat> uh, that evening, last evening, that we were here together, I just briefly went over, I just mentioned about, um, there's a black snake. And I've been experiencing the black snake. And the black snake seems to be the unconscious, um, journey that we take until we're ready um, through experience of going through this entire realm of unconsciousness <laughs> starting from the beginning and widening and then refining so that we can move our consciousness back through the diamond. So I mentioned a little bit about that snake. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight <clears throat> is um, that snake and how important that snake is. So um, <clears throat> uh, okay, a couple of side things. How important this um, understanding is, we see it in almost every religion. The movement back towards the quantum through the six directions. Many of you have seen probably this symbol in the church, and that would represent more or less this. Once you die to the cross, die on their cross, you're crossing from here into the upper part. The Egyptians, they did it a little bit different. They would show this, the eye of the needle. <laughs> Make it through there and you have eternal life. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> and we talked also about that. Um, um, eye of the needle uh, that's shaped inside of the onk. In our Western religion, sometimes we see this on very important people. Yeah? Cardinals, popes. <clears throat> and then we also see, um, what is it, this? Actually, I think it's Same kind of message. This is the X, Y, and Z, and you go through the eye, of the eye of the needle, which brings you up above, out of the darkness. And one other symbol. <clears throat> when I was working on this stuff here, <clears throat> um, I was receiving downloads, and so they were showing me that if you follow these through, then of course you have the seven. Oh, well, I drew that really badly. You have the seven. Um, altruistic um, uh, uh, what would you call that branches the seven um, branches of altruism and the seven roots of separation consciousness and they said uh, they were showing me you've seen this before I said really they said yeah you know this symbol I said, oh, that makes so much sense, <laughs> because if you do this, 
there it is. And so this becomes very important right here. And so I looked it up, the menorah, and the original menorah brought to the Hebrews by um, Moses while he was in the desert. He was shown straight from God that these are the seven these are the seven lights of universal consciousness. Oh, wow. <laughs> I went, oh my gosh. Now, I didn't go over the seven um, attributes or the seven altruistic branches because what's our nature as human beings? We focus on the positive and we try to deny, repress, ignore <laughs> the negative. So, if we worked on these here, worked on accepting them, worked on compassionately appreciating them, then they lead naturally to the lighted seven branches. So in the original temple, <clears throat> they had the seven um, uh, branches in the menorah. And then after the second, what was it? The second desecration um, of the temple, I think in 67 BC or something like that, <clears throat> um, uh, they only had enough oil, uh, consecrated oil or purified oil, um, to keep that going. Supposed, the lights were supposed to keep going all the time, and there wasn't enough oil. There was enough oil for one day, but it lasted eight. And so that's why you have Hanukkah, which has the nine uh, candles. Um, and after that, only the seven was allowed inside of the temple. It wasn't allowed, the seven branch menorah wasn't allowed outside of the temple from what I was reading on it. So anyway, <clears throat> these symbols are quite interesting how they line up with how important this um, process of moving from unconsciousness to consciousness and compassionate appreciation, which moves you out of the timeline into superposition. Huh. Okay, so the snake. Everybody following me? Yep, okay. Ah, good, there's a clean one. Um, the snake. Um, I have to go to some sacred geometry really quick. And we all know Purusha. We've talked about it plenty of times. And Prakriti. And the movement was simply taking Purusha right here at the midpoint, twisting it in opposite directions, like twisting a balloon, and we created then Purusha and Void. <clears throat> so in sacred geometry, and this is not very good drawn, in sacred geometry um, Purusha is um, source or creator or God. And uh, once the void was created, in sacred geometry we can draw a line from the center of the Creator, through the doorway, and into the void. Now, in many um, uh, cultures all around the world, ancient cultures, you can find sites created out of stone. You can find sites that um, angle their constructions for the rising of the sun on the solstice, uh, excuse me, on the equinox, so that a ray of light penetrates a cave and goes all the way in, or a window, and it goes all the way and hits a very special altar or stone, the first ray of light. And then from that ray of light, it begins to widen and widen, creating um, um, 
creating a boundary of light. So this movement of light is symbolized in sacred geometry of this light coming in here. Now, into the void, uh, as we came into the void, the duality came with us. But they separated because they were unconscious. So, it began a process of experiencing through, if we were to draw the midpoint, this would be masculine, which is projective and separative. So as this continued, it went through experiencing masculine, projective, separative, and then it kind of reverses and gets into the feminine and integrative. So when we came down here, this black snake that I was talking about is the serpent of our life force energy, our unconsciousness and our movement and awakening. But it came at the same time with its counterpart. But its counterpart, we could say, was conscious or more conscious. And this would be like <clears throat> our higher self. So we went through a journey in this one aspect here. We went through a journey of um, experiencing um, um, very basic um, ideas from unconsciousness. Ideas such as morality, morals. Okay, so in unconsciousness, when we interacted with each other as unconscious beings, we learned some basic protocols that we couldn't... Um, if we acted unconsciously towards another, we would probably get the mirror reflection. And so we learned quite quickly, um, it's advantageous to treat the other individual with a little more respect and dignity, okay? So, in the beginning, this... Um, uh, one snake is learning some basic morals. And it's being guided to the best degree that it can by the little angel on the left or right shoulder, whatever you prefer. Um, that's trying to talk sense into you, but you got a lot of unconsciousness going on, okay? So you're basically learning morals during uh, this, and it refines. It starts off in very basic stages, and as it goes through time, it starts learning to refine that, and it goes through um, masculine versions of it, and then feminine versions of it. So we go through morals, which then leads us into behaviors. So there's another um, set of spirals that happen. Another set of snakes. And this is very mental and emotional. But it's very rudimentary. And it has to go through the same type of um, experiences through the gamut of time and experience. It runs through all these seasons of it and then it flips to the opposite side and it starts learning it from a different aspect. So as an example, um, 
we're not only born as male every lifetime. We're born some male, some female, and who takes care of this? It's on another level. But we've all been masculine and we've all been feminine. Because we're all from the one and we're whole and we're complete. So we all have all the components within us of both masculine and feminine. But we have to learn those. It has to be awakened inside of us. So we have a serpent of unconsciousness and consciousness. So that consciousness, it kind of stays invisible and it, and it's, it really depends on us of when we can quiet ourselves. So this one snake is the Asclepius rod. The rod of Asclepius is one snake. But it's drawn like this. There's an implied second. The next one, let's say um, mental and emotional. <clears throat> and that is where we start to learn um, more about our behaviors. Um, and we start to... Uh, Let's say we learn behaviors, being in families, being in relationships, being in business. There's different moral, um, not moral codes, but um, behavioral codes. So we're basically, by these two different snakes coming up, we're blending morals and behaviors. But they're all kind of coming from mental, not consciousness. They're coming from the character. Okay, so you're learning as a character how to apply yourself in these different conditions under and how to apply it to males and to females. Different protocols, right, between the two, but you're learning these two different areas here. Now, the third area, the, so there's three sets of snakes. This is Asclepius, and this is Hermes Caduceus. I hope I spelt that right. But in Hermes Caduceus, you can see the ray of light coming from the Creator. And you have the serpent's head here. This is usually drawn with a wing here. <clears throat> so we have morals, behaviors, which leads to an emotional intelligence. An emotional intelligence. So the emotional intelligence is taking all three morals, behaviors, and integrated emotional intelligence, bringing them all three together. What is the emotional intelligence? Integrated emotional intelligence is about learning the morals, behaviors, the actions, the protocols that are necessary inside of family, business, world, cultural, all these different things. But not from here. Not from the mind. You see, when we feed the mind these protocols, then we start to engage an unexpected bad habit. And that is we start fueling the tyrant, our inner tyrant, with more protocols 
about taking on empty rituals, empty habits, patterns, and upholding um, contracts, um, expectations, entitlements, uh, judgments, all these things that have to do with family, business, cultural, whenever we're in any other environment or in any other kind of group setting with human beings, we have a whole list of morals, behaviors, and empty rituals, expectations, um, have-to-dos, um, and these things are what draw your energy out of you and fuel the tyrant and those inner voices about you're not living up to and you know what I mean when you go into your family setting if you have brothers and sisters there's a pecking order and there's a lot of contracts unexpected or uninvited unconscious contracts of behaviors attitudes actions and emotions that take place and in those empty habits and patterns and behaviors you start beating so you start grading yourself so you're not really emotionally or psychologically free you're operating on the mind and the tyrants uh, parameters its litmus its uh, grading system so in the emotional intelligence realm the third snake you see we can't really free can't really free ourselves until we're aware of these three different snakes which are life force energies. We have worked a lot with seeing stories, beliefs, and how they fuel the inner tyrant, but we also need to look at the emotional intelligence. Now, freedom in the emotional intelligence range is about bringing all three of these, the morals, behaviors, and emotional intelligence, into your being, which is, it's already operating. It's already there. So if you allow yourself to be really vulnerable in the moment, then you can start to flag when you're, let's say, in a family dynamic, and your, your brother or your sister always insists that they be treated in a certain way, and you're subordinate. <laughs> and so... Um, Unless you uphold these unconscious contracts, then you're failing and their attitude towards you changes dramatically. How can you remain free? Because you start buying into their grading system and it starts poking hole in your energy field. Okay? So, um, between a, um, let's say, um, uh, two master businessmen, meaning they've been in business for 30 years, and they're very integrous. Two businessmen come together and they realize, oh, we can work together to help each other in a joint venture. We'll write up a contract. And so, in that case, they both know the comings and goings, the highs and lows of what to expect inside of any business venture and challenge that arises. And so inside of the contract is a display of the beauty of their consciousness because it's equal, equal, equal. Okay? So in that case, that's a real contract. If, let's say, one of those master businessmen didn't have that same kind of integrity and hired uh, an individual just coming out of high school. 
<laughs> and is looking <laughs> for an easy contract <laughs> under easy conditions. Is that a real contract? No, because it's not a contract of equals. So the argument then goes to the young man who's unfulfilled in his mastery. He has a good argument. He has a good argument that he was taken advantage of. He didn't know the highs and lows and all the things to look out for. All right. Apex moment in dreams is what I wanted to get to from all of this. Mm -hmm. Unconscious contracts. You see, with the Waterloo situation, the Waterloo incident, that was my low point. And it helped me a lot. It gave me a lot of clarity and a lot of awakening. It opened my eyes, so it freed me. It freed me from a lot of unconsciousness. So it helped me integrate immensely. Immensely enough to now then move to the next level. So if we graph that and say that the Waterloo moment is the bottom of the barrel, so on a sine wave curve, we could put that as the bottom of the barrel. So that's the under. <laughs> if there's fractures in the Waterloo moment, respectively, this is a reality of dualities, so there is an apex moment. What? <laughs> an apex moment that fractures? How? <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> well, we just went over morals, behaviors, and emotional intelligence. And we went over um, conscious contracts and unconscious contracts. So, in an apex moment, um, in an apex moment, let's say, like, in my Waterloo moment, my mom, I saw, I projected onto my mom, she should have been there to emotionally nurture and protect me. She should have been there. She should have. There's a good clue that you're missing. She should have. And so there's an emotional contract, unconscious contract, that's <clears throat> as the, um, the neophyte trying to make a contract with the master. <laughs> <laughs> under the neophyte's conditions. <laughs> it's probably going to be laughed at. Uh, <clears throat> well, my archetypal um, projection, which I could call my dream, my dream in that situation would, to be, would be to have a female relationship that nurtured me, loved me, and so on and so forth, and all the ways That my mom didn't. Take care of me in all the ways that I wanted and needed, even if so unconscious. Does that work? <laughs> How can someone know your needs in any given moment, your challenges, your fears, your emotional states, and then rescue you mm. or talk you mm. out? of their, or bring you to wholeness. Who can do that? Was anybody assigned here to do that for you? No. Should be. Should, no, should be. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be in the contract. <laughs> the next contract. <laughs> Before we come back in. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be intuitive to my needs. <laughs> so the apex moment 
you can start to see the fractures. The fractures are unconscious contracts and projections of your needs. So you dream a need. You dream your ideal relationship and you're unconscious of what all those are, but it's in the general direction because you can't know all the details of the imagined perfect relationship. So you just go out there and you, I need a relationship with, you know, this. And you go out with that net of these unconscious needs and beliefs and projections and contracts and all of this, and you go bag <laughs> relations, whoever volunteers to go. <laughs> and how does that work out? <laughs> as soon as the other person starts feeling some of those unconscious contracts and entitlements and expectations and resists. Uh oh, that one didn't work out. All right, well, let's go dream up a new one and <laughs> start another relationship. Whoever fits in the bag and we'll start from there. Because do you talk about your needs? clearly spelled out before you have a continuity of deepening your relationship? We do you don't do that? Know what they are. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so there's negative splits and unconscious positive splits. So polarized positive. Polarized positive. So it's not that you're fixing anything here. I'm not adding to a list of things to fix. I'm pointing out that to free yourself, you've got to awaken to these unconscious aspects that are going on and accept them. So I had to go back and go back through girlfriends and girlfriends. And <laughs> What are all these unconscious contracts I've put out there that create entanglements? So an entanglement creates a dream where you're dreaming of the perfect dream. <laughs> so if you're dreaming unconsciously, you're creating entanglements. <laughs> you got to live those out <laughs> until you disassemble them. Okay? So, just like the Waterloo moment, <clears throat> the pain and suffering, okay, you don't run from it, and like being on the cross, you let them all come back in. And vacuum out the place, clean it all up, and everything dissolves. The timeline, the reality line, the entanglement dissolves. You're free. You're free. So, again, in the apex moment, we see the unconscious dreams and contracts, projections in the polarized positive of all our relationships, even our casual relationships. So it's reinforcing the very split we dissociate if the candy looks good enough, yeah, I'll go for it. And you split from your center and you go for the, <laughs> you go for the candy, right? You go for the lure, get hooked into another timeline, into a probability, into an entanglement. Well, same with the pain. The pain did the same thing. So we have a pain and a polarized positive pleasure. So we dream a split. We split from ourself because you're looking for yourself. The other person is there to help reflect back to you the unconscious need for you to see you and how powerful you are, how fulfilled you are accepting yourself, embracing yourself. And it's hard to do. That's hard. But that's what's coming. And as that doorway that we talked about at the beginning of this, <clears throat> we have a we have Ophiuchus standing with the serpent. The unconscious serpents that we have, 
that lead us into the unconscious dreams, both polarized positive and polarized negative. Ophiuka stands in victory, waiting for you to grab a hold, embrace your life force serpents, let them arise back in you, accepting them back through the eye of the needle and through the diamond. So accept your dreams. Because as you accept your dreams, you find your completions inside you, rather than running. So, I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments? No? Okay, good. We'll take longer in meditation today. Anything unclear? <laughs> I need to take a quick break. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'm just not connecting the snake stuff with what you were talking about. How is it connecting? Um, first of all, <clears throat> remember I said we kind of got to go through sacred geometry to understand the, geom uh, the geometry of uh, these symbols, okay? And from the geometry, we take the center of the one, the center of Purusha. And although we know, simultaneously when Purusha said, I wonder what it would be like not to know ourselves. Right at that moment, the unconsciousness formed, the twisting happened, the separation began, and this demonstrates linearly, although we know it's happening simultaneous. But this light from Purusha starts the split. The split is the duality. Conscious and unconscious operating down here. Now it starts experiencing through all the um, seasons of life. So that's like circling. The snake is a spiral? Yes. Yes. So that's the sacred geometry component. Yes. Yes. And the spiral goes through, just like our DNA, goes through so many different experiences, building, activating, connecting. And from experience, consciousness slowly begins to awaken. Okay? So as the unconsciousness goes through what is masculine first, then feminine, reintegrating, then it starts to call back in the other components. It starts integrating the additional components. <clears throat> and those components, what happened with the unconscious and conscious was also at the same time there was three. You could probably even say more, but three is enough. Where we started basic morals, behaviors from a linear, from a mental framework, an emotional framework, and then we brought it into emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is when we're separating and moving into consciousness, where your body feels it. You don't have to think about how to treat a person with balance and equality and care. How many people get to that, though? We're all, like we're all. We're, many of us are bringing, are coming to that awareness now. We're moving into a, um, a state where we're no longer operating from, remember the spiral of time is creating the centrifuge, which is forcing you to move in. Moving in is moving into the toroidal field of your energy field. That toroidal field is more feeling sense. And we have experience, so we move out of the mind, and the emotional body is, is now ready to be present and aware, so it is moving into a state of beingness. So you, you're, 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 you can be free of all any contracts, your conscious 
of what contracts are, unconscious contracts, empty rituals, habits and patterns, and all of these things. <clears throat> so you don't have to think about it. You remain free. You're not judging yourself from the tyrant. Tyrant has so many things in its hand and is grading you on all of them and beating you. That's you doing that to you. Instead, notice the tyrant and notice the life force energy, the morals, the behaviors, mental, mental and emotional, and move them to consciousness. Your consciousness is ready and able now to hold the whole field and just be and respond consciously to whatever arises. There is no have to do. Like the Ten Commandments in the stone. Right. There is no, no longer. You don't go by that. You go by consciousness and your feeling body. It's been integrating the mind, the emotion, the male, the female, the inner child, the adult. All of these elements ha have been coming to a point where now you can just be in the consciousness and respond and pay attention to when the tyrant comes up and starts grading and starts deflating your energy body. It's time to move into the being, your being. And that means clearing the heart and understanding and seeing clearly and compassionately all of these aspects. Does that help? I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> You won't get to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> One o'clock in the morning. Be this is our house. We'll talk about discussion all day long. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to drag you guys through it. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably going to have to go get a motel room to get a good rest. <laughs> <ride. laughs> yeah, that'll be Monday. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting because um, uh, we, co we, we often tease each other, my wife and I, that um, we come from opposite um, um, realms. Um, she comes from the star and from like those upper realms and I'm coming from the earth. So I come from the emotional realms. And so um, often I speak in an emotional language which tries to cover uh, intellectual intelligence married with emotional behaviors. And that I try to communicate as a, as a whole. She communicates, she communicates uh, from uh, like a higher intellect um, point of view, which is very... Emotionless. <laughs> But aren't you, uh, I mean, like you said, the emotion and body, but you're going to a spiritual aspect of this. This is the whole idea here is to, like you say, accept it and stop judging it. And so you can experience life here more in a spiritual aspect, a more spiritual uh, more spiritual emotion? I don't know. Uh, just Well, yes, it's, it's a matter of taking the stair step, so to speak, to grounding it all in the body. Yeah, okay. You ground all heaven and earth and universe. Purusha and Prakriti exists. You know, that twist in the balloon is right at the center of the four quadrants of your heart. So if we're all here, it makes sense, ground it all here, and be more present with all those realms opening up for so you. It's like uh, people like to say you're a spiritual being having a, 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 human, experience. a human experience, but now you're really going to be a spiritual being in a human experience. Yes. That's kind of my impression of what yes. we're trying to do here. Yes. So you kind of, you've gone through all this stuff. It's kind of like you've reclaimed your own um, self, soul, whatever you want to say, and now you can really live here. Yes. In a, in a very, really good. I, I don't know, spiritual, productive, yeah. yes. really fun. Really good. It's really good. I really like it. Really yes, really good. exactly. As, 
as I've been going through this and reclaiming, you know, all those cherubs and stewarding my cherubs, what it's what's been happening is there's been greater space inside. So at the very, I'm, I feel like there's a throne right at the center of the two balloons. There's a throne. It's infinitely small, small and paradoxically complete. And as you um, bring these, steward these um, dualities back through the pains Apex and Waterloo, then what happens is you stay here more. You stay centered more. There are times it, it throws you out, but you know how to get back in and reclaim. Once you, once you move into that, that's like the chariot. The chariot is waiting. Your, your heart is a chariot. It's a diamond chariot. And it's waiting for you to clear the space and sit in the throne and allow to preside over, you know, the, your Prakriti and your Purusha. So you have access everywhere. You're moving back into yourself. You're grounding all of those back into you. Yep. Very good. Huge. Okay, so um, we're going to do a meditation. <laughs>